Um, as we've already heard today, I'm going to be talking about how we can classify individual cases of concussion uh, using MEG imaging, which we've heard a lot about today. Um, <clears throat> so in the pr pr previous talks, you know, we've heard plenty about MRI. It's a fantastic imaging technique. You know, it tells us really detailed information about brain structure, the white matter connectivity, uh, as well as indirect correlates of neural activity like hemodynamics. Um, and I'm acutely aware of time, so I'm going to kind of skip through this, but there's all sorts of studies of concussion that have shown uh, reductions in, in cortical thickness, uh, changes in the white matter, as well as changes in the hemodynamics and coupling between different areas of the brain. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really this incredible, powerful technique. Um, but one thing it does lack, really, is the temporal sensitivity of neurophysiological techniques like EEG or MEG. Um, and these are based directly on measurement of the electrical currents in the brain. You know, there's very rapid firing of neurons um, down to about the millisecond. Uh, so, you know, my bread and butter technique is MEG. Um, it's fantastically well tolerated, especially by, by people who aren't quite so compliant. Um, and yeah, it tells us about the ongoing fluctuations in neural activity in the brain. So it complements MRI quite nicely. Uh, so as I say, you know, one, one of the great things about MEG is that we, we get this rapid measurement of brain activity down to about a thousandth of a second, you know, many, many times a second we're recording brain activity. And we can look at that and we can look at very, very slow brain activity all the way through to very, very fast brain activity. And different areas of the brain operate kind of at different speeds. You know, that's a very simplistic explanation. But what we find is that there are characteristic profiles of different areas of the brain that operate at different speeds. Um, and here you can see from a group of controls that we scanned with the MEG, you get this, this, this profile of, uh, of brain activity with dominate, um, particular frequencies dominating. So you always tend to see this peak at around 10 hertz, where all these neurons are synchronizing and firing at around about 10 hertz. And this is very characteristic, and we see this across the board. And we've heard some work today uh, about MEG earlier on, and showing changes in the very, very slow brain waves uh, measured in concussion. But we want to look at our controls first. So we used computer modeling to sort of look at these, these frequency spectrum, we call them, and we find these big peaks. 10 hertz and around about 20 hertz and in the sort of EEG MEG world we call this the alpha and beta oscillation alpha and beta waves um, but when we looked at our MTBI population you know these are young adults with a, a diagnosed MTBI we actually find that the, the beta rhythm is completely uh, absent there so this very very fast brain wave at 20 hertz is completely absent you know we often see this upregulation of these very slow waves this is commonly reported across EEG MEG we've reported it before as, many, as well as many other groups um, but a reanalysis of the data using computational modeling finds that these very very fast brain waves this fast neural activity is almost completely absent and when we looked at across the brain it was where that was occurring we find that you know it's all across these frontal cortices there were reductions in um, this fast brain activity this beta brain activity this is interesting enough. But when we compare the two groups side by side, we, we find that there's a huge degree of variance, right? This is going to be no help if we want to do a single case. If we want to di diagnose a single case of concussion, uh, you know, this is going to be no help at all. So in this, in this voxel here, in the right DLPFC, where the biggest effect was, you can see here we have all our individual participants, and there's quite a lot of overlap. So we're not really going to be able to diagnose an individual MTBI in this case. <clears throat> As I said, you know, the fantastic thing about MEG is that we record this rapid, fast neural activity, these dynamics. So we can also look at the dynamics of brain activity. And once again, um, at the beta rhythm, at that 20 hertz rhythm, we find that's also reduced across the brain quite substantially. <clears throat> so the dynamics, you know, the complexity of these signals is also reduced. Once again, though, similar to power, the power measurements that I, I talked about just a second ago, um, you know, there's a huge degree of overlap. We see these significant effects using statistics, um, but this isn't really going to be able to diagnose a, a concussion on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, the holy grail is really being able to try and pick out individual cases. So then we looked at connectivity, functional connectivity. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard of that. And these two... Um, plots side by side, all the pixels in there indicate a different connection in the brain. And straight away, you can kind of see that there are, there are differences in the patterns between MTBI and control. Again, this is group level. And then when we do a comparison between the groups, we see that there are many, many reductions across the brain. So these blue connections show that it's reduced in the beta range in how these areas are communicating. Um, but it seems pretty nonspecific. You know, it's all over the place. It uh, doesn't, doesn't really tell us too much, to be honest. And it's still the similar problem of those regional measures where there's a lot of overlap uh, between the groups. So this provides a nice, you know, interesting insight into neural function, really <laughs> complements the structural imaging that we have, as well as the hemodynamics. But its clinical utility really is limited. 
Um, so is there a way that we can go from this group level inference down to picking out individual cases? So in our, you know, there are many different challenges studying concussion as we're all quite aware, group demographics, the heterogeneity of injury, but is there any way that we can embrace that heterogeneity um, and identify consistent common features that are found across, across uh, our varied groups? So we set ourselves uh, the challenge of identifying one individual. And this was actually done by um, a postdoc in the lab, fantastic postdoc, uh, postdoc, Dr. Jing Zhang. Jing, give us a wave. He's ignoring me. There we go. Um, so he, I set him the challenge of being able to identify one individual case using MEG data. So he used computational modeling as well as a data-driven approach uh, combined with machine learning to do this. So here are the injury characteristics of our group. You know, it's quite varied, many different mechanisms, for the most part sport, but falls, injuries, accidents, even some assaults. Uh, we had a mixed bag of time since injury, mostly occurring in the acute, subacute stage, but sort of moving into the uh, chronic phase as well, you know, three months out and beyond. And we had a scattering of symptoms. Uh, you know, some were pretty much asymptomatic, some had some pretty severe symptoms there as well, measured on the SCAT too. But we wanted to embrace that heterogeneity. Was there something that we could pick out as a common feature across, across, uh, across this group? So here's our uh, injury characteristics from all our participants. So we selected one, this guy here, you know, ID13, whoever that is. He was about three weeks out from an MTBI, never lost consciousness, um, you know, had a, a, a GCS of 15, had some slight uh, PTA, uh, and he had the injury playing sports. So we used machine learning. I'm sure, you know, you've all heard of this buzzword nowadays. Um, but it's basically a way of letting the machine learn um, without interference essentially and learn implicitly from the data that's given it and recognize patterns within that data. So you know you have a training data set to look for those patterns. What does it look like? What is that? What is that case? And then you feed in test data and then it makes a prediction about whether that is or is not a case. In this case it would be a binary case of either yes or no, a brain injury. So it's a great way of um, automating complex modeling um, and doing pattern recognition. So MEG data is perfect for this. You know here's our connectivity matrix that I talked about earlier on where we have all of these different connections in the brain and their different strengths, how the two areas of the brain are talking to one another. So this is our guy, number 13 here. So could we identify them from all the other participants that we collected? So here's our mixed data set. These, these are the first two principal components. Uh, you know, it's multidimensional and I can't really plot that in 2D space. But you can see that when we combine all the MEG data together, everyone's kind of mixed in together. There doesn't really seem to be this immediate separation out of uh, the two groups there. And here's our guy right in the middle. You know, can we identify number 13 there? So I'm not going to bore you with the details really, but um, we use some pretty standard techniques in the lab. Um, machine learning selection, classification, feature reduction. Uh, we might have heard it earlier on, I think, a support vector machine. But basically using a random forest and a nonlinear SVM, we can kind of distill down to those connections which maximally separate at the groups and individual cases. So, you know, we've gone from that very complicated mess of connections that we saw earlier on to getting these connections which maximally separate out the groups, the combinations of connections which do that. And we find that it's actually this interhemispheric sensory motor decoupling, disconnectivity, decommunication at this very fast brain rhythm, the brain rhythm that we can really only pick up very reliably and resolve in space using MEG. Uh, so here, you know, we've got a pre-feature selection. When we throw all the data in together, you know, we can see everyone's mixed together. And then with this two-dimensional separation here, you know, there's that, that one control in there, but this doesn't show the three-dimensional plane very well. Um, this individual case, just right there. Um, so here's our area under the curve. You know, we, we heard a little bit about that earlier on. And we can basically, with 100% accuracy, using this uh, well-tolerated brain scan, it's only five minutes. You don't need to put on any gels or caps. You just slide them in. Um, we can pretty much separate out completely a concussion case from a control case. So that's with the connectivity data. And we used a similar pipeline to test the regional changes in dysfunction as well. Um, you know, I mentioned some of the group level data earlier on. And we can operate just about above chance using a similar pipeline there. So, you know, there are some caveats here. This is a relatively small sample size. You know, it's bound to be biased. There's problems of overfitting feature selection there, but we're working on this. Um, but, you know, as we can increase the data set from our 27 concussed cases, about 25 controls, you know, we're likely to see a reduction in that accuracy, um, but it would certainly increase the generalizability to no, uh, naive cases. So, you know, we've really been able to show that 
higher accuracy can be achieved when we, we think of brain injury you know, as kind of disturbing a network, disturbing large-scale circuits in the brain, rather than um, being related to a focal disturbance, which is likely to be very heterogeneous across your group. You know, someone might have aberrated delta or beta over here, someone else it might be over here. Um, so when we sort of conceptualize the brain you know, as a network, as a circuit, as we do nowadays, that seems to be far better at discriminating. Uh, out single cases. So really sort of embracing computer modeling, machine learning, AI, whatever we want to call it, um, has allowed us to identify the, this neural dis dysfunction, disruption, um, including deficits in very fast brain activity that we can pick up. And we've been able to pull out common features that can separate out our groups. Uh, they're actually quite heterogeneous in terms of their clinical sample. And it seems to be really driven by these beta oscillations, these beta rhythms, which we know are actually sort of involved in sending signals down, top-down descending pathways. And we do require large data sets. You know, we're sort of getting there. We've only got um, in the order of about 50 subjects at the moment, but we're always recruiting more. And this is an incredibly easy scan. It's well tolerated by kids and adults. It takes about five minutes. We don't need to apply any gels or pastes. You know, it's not noisy or claustrophobic like an MRI. Um, but in the future, we hope to be able to use this with, uh, you know, return to work sport uh, and deployment protocols in the military. So with that, I'd just like to thank my uh, collaborators as well as my funding partners, and thank you all for listening. Thanks. Yeah, so um, we've previously published on that. Um, our, our data aligns with some of the other data coming out of uh, San Diego, Ming Zhang Wang's group, um, you know, where we find these regional aberrated delta as well as increased delta coupling. So, you know, I've always kind of approached this from a um, circuit network based approach as opposed to sort of like regional changes in delta, but we, we do see that as well. Um, this was kind of a re examining of the data using some uh, recent advances in computational modeling. Um, and we noticed that the, the beta deficit was there as well. But yeah, we, 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 see, we see the delta dysfunction as well. Yep. Um, I have a question about the future selection. I was wondering how many pairs of regions you had, and when you do the future selection, how many you end up with? We end up yeah, with, yeah, I didn't actually put the number on there, did I? Reduce them from the 4,000 um, connections in the brain. So that depends basically on how you parcelate the brain. We use a 90 by 90. Um, so we have an undirected matrix of about 4,000 odd connections. You can actually speak with Jing, who sat right there, who did a lot of the analysis. I don't remember off the top of my head the exact number of, of connections, um, but it was pretty much a lot of those sensory motor pairs into hemispheric pairs. I think it was in the order of about 40 or 50. Thank you. Thanks.